Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Politico Live. My name is Mark Scott. I'm Politico's chief tech correspondent, and I'm delighted to bring you an exclusive transatlantic interview uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are, um, around Politico's recently launched brand new digital bridge newsletter, which I author. Before we get into the great conversation we have planned for you today, a couple of uh, points I want to make. First, please submit your questions. I have a TV, uh, computer screen over here, and I'll be hoping to get as many of them answered uh, for you as possible during the next 35 minutes. Second of all, uh, please tweet. We are looking to get as much uh, social media presence as possible around hashtag Politico AI. So thanks for that. Before we um, introduce our two speakers, let's set some of the steam. Uh, we have the G7 uh, summit coming up next week, and President Biden is coming to Brussels, frankly, the, right afterwards to discuss a variety of topics with his counterparts in Brussels. We are here with Cedric O, France's digital minister, and Eric Schmidt, the chair of excuse me, the US National Security National Security, National Security Commission on AI to talk everything we, uh, about transatlantic cooperation and AI. So uh, to um, Eric and Cedric, thank you so much for joining us uh, in your respective you. places. Before There's a lot to cover in the next 35 minutes. So let's start out with some of the easy wins. We have the G7 coming up and on a variety of topics, both tech and non-tech, the G7 have sort of been, has been the cluster where a variety of policies have begun. From your both perspectives, where can, say, France, uh, the US and Europe more broadly cooperate around AI and, and setting both the investment principles and maybe the rules uh, for this technology going forward? Uh, Minister Cedric O, let's start with you. Where, where would you like to see cooperation be built with the US? Well, thank you first for having me uh, today. To, to be brief, I would say that I think that as uh, as the Western world, let's let put it like this, we, we have two main challenges. Uh, the first one, and, and, and I think this is the first challenges, ch challenge, and it is uh, mentioned within uh, Eric's report, is to, to keep up with the innovation space. Um, the US especially, but the Western world as a whole was ahead in terms of innovation, in terms of, uh, uh, of creativity, of, of, of technological innovation. But what we are seeing is that the, the, the gap is being bridged by a lot of countries, especially China. So we have to insist on innovation. I, I insist on that point because if we look at, at uh, the overall world, if you want to be at the table, if you want to be the guy that is shaping the standards, even in terms of, of human-centric approach, you have to be the most innovative guide. We are in a world where the leader is setting the standards. So this is the first challenge that we have to answer. Um, obviously, there, are, there is an ongoing, I would say, competition or competition <clears throat> between Europe, the US, and I think this is sane. Um, <clears throat> but we have to bear in mind that we, we, we need to, to keep up with the innovation rate. Second challenge that we have to be able to answer to um, is, I would say, a sustainability issue. What we see among the middle classes in, 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 uh, in developed country, we've seen that in, in France, especially with the Yellow Vest uh, movement, in the, US, in the UK uh, with the Brexit, in the US to some extent in, in South America, is that there is an acceptability issue within the population, within the middle class of technology. To some extent, technology is seen as something raising inequalities, creating a world where a whole part of the population has difficulty to, um, to evolve. And we have to be able to, to build a framework, legislative framework, a, a regulation framework that is giving reassurance to, to, our, to our citizens. And, and we have to be able, that is what we, we all call human-centric uh, issues, we have to be able to show that we, we might have some differences, but what is uniting us as, as democracies, as far as technology is concerned, is much more important uh, than what is uh, uh, dividing us to, to some extent. And, and we have, especially in the, in the current contest of competition with some non-democratic countries, uh, we have to be able to, 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 to show that and to give evidence to that. And, and that's why I think the discussion that we have in the, among the, in the G7 uh, framework, but also uh, uh, the, the one that we are having, and we, we had the opportunity with Eric to discuss that uh, a year and a half ago, ago when I, and I was traveling to the, to the US. The discussion that we are, for instance, having um, in the Global Partnership for Artificial, uh, Artificial Intelligence within the EOCD network are very important because we have 
to build a common approach between like-minded countries. Eric, there's a couple of points I want to bring up there. First is investment. The, your commission report, I think the last report was in March, made it very clear that both for the US and like-minded democracies, investment was key. So just taking from the minister's perspective here, what would you like to see done both from the US government, but also more uh, from the US allies in terms of investing in the technology? Where, what, what, what needs to get done there? Um, so first, thank you very much for having, having me and covering this. Minister Cedric was the first minister we met with in Europe, and he's clearly the leader in this space. And the work that he's doing on GPay, uh, which he can describe further, is incredibly important for both Europe as well as um, essentially Western leadership. Our report spends a quite a bit of time trying to assess where we are with respect to the other competitors, in particular China, we conclude that in key platforms, and this is not just AI, it's also semiconductors, synthetic biology, energy, quantum, um, a few others. Uh, the Chinese are either ahead or slightly behind. And the Chinese have announced publicly that they intend to either lead or dominate in all of these spaces by 2030. That's why the uh, G7 summit you're referring to has a whole session on emerging technology platforms um, and our report proposes a technology coordination committee at the White House uh, vice president or presidential level, and the GPAY is analogous to that. So we have an alignment problem, and we also have a money problem. Our report proposes that the U.S. government double the funding for AI research every year for four or five years. And it also uh, suggests, for example, uh, essentially something which is an awful lot like the United States CHIPS Act which is federal sources of funds to make it much more likely that domestic semiconductor production will be successful because we think that's very strategic as well. Can we just maybe focus a little bit of time on the global partnership for AI that as the minister and yourself, Eric, mentioned? Because I think it's key here in terms of what both the G7, the G20 and the OECD system can can, can work. Uh, minister, can you just, you had, there was a meeting in, I think, Montreal back in December in terms of sort of next steps here. How important do you think it is in terms of cooperation that sort of the global partnership for AI set out the, the structure focused on both the ethics, the, the impact on workforce, the investment um, required. I mean, what happens next in that structure? Because it feels to me that as much as the United States and France may work separately on many things, and we can get to the friction in a minute, there has been some pretty good cooperation so far. And what have you taken from, from that structure? Well, for, first, I want to get back on one thing that you just said is that there are obviously differences between Europe and the US. There are differences between the US and, and, and France in terms of balance between innovation and regulation and so on and so on. But, but let's keep in mind the fact that what is uniting us is much more important than what is dividing us. Otherwise, let's say other countries, other non-democratic countries could, could play in, 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 that, in that area and, and, and that would be terrible. So, so this is, I think, the first thing to, to keep in mind. And, and this is important to keep that in mind. And that was the philosophy that was at the basis of the creation of the global partnership of, of artificial intelligence. We, we have to work on, on what are our common standards. That, that won't be exactly the same, but we have to work on our common standards. And the philosophy of the GPI was, at first, we need our scientists to work together. Otherwise, if we, we, we begin with the political part, then everybody will have competition and, and, and technological uh, innovation in, in the back of its head. So we have to build scientific consensus on which we can have political discussions. And I think that there has been a, a very uh, efficient uh, first part of work that has been uh, um, unfolding over the past year um, with some countries, uh, I won't name all, all of them, but all are, are like-minded countries. And France really has been really insisting uh, very uh, heavily on the fact that from the beginning, we wanted the US to be there. Because there is no point in making, in designing a, a, a regulation or a, an approach of like-minded countries and artificial intelligence without having 
the leaders here and which is leader by far. Eric is mentioning that, that he wants the US to increase its in investment within uh, artificial intelligence. That's, that is putting a huge pressure on Europe because we are all already lagging behind. So this is a philosophy. First, a scientific discussion, and then we can have political discussion. And I think that this is what we're going to build in the coming weeks and, and months. You both mentioned China as a sort of potentially existential threat to how Western democracies approach AI purely because of the amount of money they have available, the data domestically that they can use to power their AI systems. Eric, your report is quite scathing in terms of the, the, the threat or the perceived threat that China approaches. Do you think the US right now is in a position to, to combat that? Um, it is if it wants to. Um, I am really quite convinced now that our policymakers and government leaders, with the exception of Ministry Minister Cedric and yourself and a few people on this call, do not understand how serious this is for national security. Uh, if you look at the history of China and you look at the investments they're making, they're highly likely to catch up or lead in key areas which are platform technologies that affect not just the security of these countries, but also the economic growth. Um, if you take a look at stock market values, the 20 of the 20 largest companies in the world, uh, something like 12 or 13 are in the United States and the remaining ones are in China. There are now lists of AI companies and startups in China in terms of technology and growth that rival or exceed those that are in the best in the United States. I should also, just to be very blunt, say that Europe is well behind in this area, um, not because there's no lack of talent, but it's not organized to do that, which is why the GPA stuff is so important. I would say that if you look at the problem in the United States, half of it is science, money, you know, getting the research done right, but the other half is cultural. Um, our government in the United States, and this may be true in Europe, are focused on the wrong talents in this area. They have very nice people who are not technically trained in these areas. These things are hard. AI is so difficult. It's hard for even me and I have a PhD in this area. So all I can tell you is we're not prepared. We're not prepared in our businesses. We're not prepared in our research funding. We're not prepared in our national security. We're not prepared in the Pentagon. And we have to do something. Our report says, we need to get AI ready by 2025, that it's crucial for both national security as well as economic security. Um, we did a, an analysis of China. They're ahead in data. We're slightly ahead in algorithms. They are ahead in implementation because of scale, and they are clearly leaders in certain areas such as surveillance already and likely uh, leaders in the other areas. And finally, let me say that it's traditional in the West to say, China is doing really well, but it's because we trade with them and we gave them all this stuff and they stole it and so forth. But they have all sorts of problems. They have capital problems and debt problems and population problems. And that, I think, indicates a lack of understanding of the strength of Chinese capitalism. They call it, of course, com uh, Chinese communism, communism with Chinese characteristics, which I call brutal capitalism. And the amount of investment, the amount of capital, the amount of company formation is extraordinary in Beijing and in Shanghai and likely to continue for a very long time. Minister O, do you agree with that assessment of the, the threat that China poses to Western democracy and not, not just AI? Well, um, I would say a few things. First, I, I, I still have doubts uh, on the sustainability of the Chinese model in the long run. I, I heard that I hear that, that Eric is, is not uh, completely uh, on the same uh, has not completely the same point of view. But uh, what we are seeing with with Alibaba and Tencent and the fact that the Chinese Communist Party is getting back on them, uh, I don't think that to some extent. Uh, innovation can go on uh, forever when it's it's ruled by by a unique party. But anyway, um, what I would say is that it's true that the level of investment in China are incredible. It's true that in a lot of key critical technology, they are now leading the way. And you, you have to keep in mind, um, my father is Korean, so the Asian culture is something that I know very well. What we have to keep in mind in Europe and in the Western world is China has a time. 
it, it's seeing itself, it's, it's, it's projecting itself on a, on a 100, 200 years uh, time. So, so they have time. So we have to be prepared for that. And I completely back Eric's approach on one point. In the whole battle, battle is about training and talents. I mean, the, the battle for artificial intelligence, the competition for artificial intelligence is, is about human intelligence. And to some extent, if you look at the, the battalion that China, China is training uh, in, in, in AI, in data science, and even in the US, when you look at the name of the people that are in, in, in the master science, you can guess from where they are. So, and I think that was, on that point, Europe and the US uh, are, are lagging behind, and we have to be able to, to train our population. Our leaders is, is, is part of them, but, but the whole population, if we want to be able to be at the right level of commitment. I, it wouldn't be a political event if I didn't talk about policy and policy policymaking. Uh, we've, uh, Eric mentioned the fact that of the top 20 uh, AI companies in the world, half are American, half are, are Chinese, more or less. None are European, particularly none are French. Do you think uh, both the AI strategy that the, the French government put forward and what the commission, European Commission announced a couple months ago in terms of setting the these ethical rules, uh, having sort of no-go zones in terms of what AI could be used as the right way to do it, when right now there are no French or European companies playing at the big table? Well, um, let's put it like that. Uh, you, you mentioned the, something that is a fact. Uh, we, we can also uh, mention the fact, and this is what President Macron mentioned uh, a few months ago, that the US have the FANGs, China has a BATX, and Europe has a GDPR. Uh, which is not completely um, what we want, where we want to be at the end of the day. I do believe that the European framework is a good one for two reasons. The first reason is that this is uniting the European market and, and, and fragmentation is the worst thing that we have in Europe. So at the end of the day, uniting the European market is a good thing. So we, have, we shall have the same rule for the same market. Second thing, it's a good regulation because it's balanced. The number of bad practices is really limited. And the, the, the process, I won't get into detail, um, is sustainable for, an in, for our industry. So this is both responding to the two challenges that not hampering innovation and, and, and keeping with, with a human-centric approach. But this is the way we have to go. Europe is lagging behind. Uh, uh, Eric is, is mentioning that. And you cannot imagine to be the ones that are setting the rules if you are not in the game. So the first priority for Europe is investment, investment in technology, investment in talents, and getting back on tracks. Otherwise, we won't be at the table, we will be on the table. And, and I do think that we have to keep that in mind. We have to find the right balance between innovation and regulation that is um, critical if we want to have that sustainable ability within democracies. But, but hampering innovation is not the good way to proceed. Eric, you have been on the record uh, and even in this discussion about being somewhat critical of the European approach in terms of um, creating rules before investment. Are you uh, sort of optimistic from what the minister said in terms of, yes, rules are coming, but we also need to balance that, that, that out with, with investment? So I've worked with European regulators for 30 years. And the hope of such regulation is the balance between innovation and regulation to protect the citizens of Europe. And in pretty much every case, they have hobbled the industry because of the unintended effects of suppressing innovation. And I'm speaking for myself now, not for the commission. When you look at the regulation that was proposed, if it were adopted without modification, and again, it's just a proposal, it would be a very big setback for Europe. And the reason is that the language has, defines critical infrastructure that is critical to health safety as infrastructure that's broadly used in our society. And one of the things that's in it is it requires that the system be able to explain itself. Now, as a technical matter, 
machine learning systems cannot today fully explain how they make their decisions. So unless that part of the proposal is changed, it will be very harmful to Europe. Um, I would have much preferred that the leaders in Brussels had sat down and done the equivalent of the AI commission that the United States did, which I was fortunate to be chairman of, had done an analysis of what it would take to have Europe be a leader in AI, which would include, I think, similar things, more money to universities, more training um, in the government, more use of these tools, and then also said regulation is a core component of what they're doing, that this is a values competition. The United States and Europe are, tend to be in agreement on these matters, but Europe instead did regulation first. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I would be remiss to ask for a response, Minister, in terms of where we stand. I mean, I appreciate the French position is by no means 100% the same as the European Commission, but what, what is your view on Europe making a mistake in terms of regulating first? No, there, there, there are many, there are, well, let's put it like this. Um, on, on the precise point that, that Eric is, is tackling, meaning the explainability of, of, of artificial intelligence, um, uh, I, I don't think that it is, this is um, a deal breaker. In, in, I, I mean, I don't think that that goes so far as to say uh, we cannot develop any uh, AI implementation without any uh, explainable AI. Everybody is aware that with machine learning, this is complete uh, nonsense. So uh, I think that there is something that is to be worked uh, on, on the fact that is there is some transparency, which is uh, required in terms of, of non-biased AI and so on and so on. But I don't think that this is a deal breaker in terms of, of, of uh, uh, the, the ability to develop AI system in Europe. Second thing is about uh, the, is on the fact that we are regulating before innovating. Uh, it's not completely true uh, as far as, as uh, the commission has been putting on the table a very ambitious program on innovation, not only on artificial intelligence, but also quantum computing and hyper, um, and high performance computing uh, on biotechnology and so on and so on. I don't think to be uh, straightforward that uh, as far as AI is concerned, the, ambition, the level of the ambition is enough, but, but this is a, a beginning. And yes, to, uh, on one point, Eric is right. Um, there is an ongoing difficulty, which is the fact that there is some uh, demand from reassurance and guarantee from the population uh, on technology that we have to be able to answer to. But that is what I mentioned in the beginning of my, of my speech. If we, if we only go for regulation, then we will uh, um, be, be facing huge problems in the years to come. We have to keep in mind that the first problem that we have in Europe is not enough innovation and not too many innovation, too much innovation. Can I add I have that, to say uh, that the, minister and I actually, the minister and I actually agree on, on this. The question here is, and I just want to be as blunt as I can be to our European friends, the number one investment area in China is AI. They've announced dominance plans by 2030. In the United States, there is an enormous amount of activity around artificial intelligence to the point where the leading conferences have 10,000, 15,000 research papers. The, the leaps and the bounds and so forth in this brand new field, which is not determined at all. We are 10% into this space. The future will be determined by the people who build the companies, fund the research programs, and drive this, not because of regulation, but because of the other things that the minister talked about, which are investment in infrastructure, investment in new companies, creation of competitive markets, global platforms, and all of this. Europe, by virtue of its approach, regulation first, which I'll call it that, has the danger of not being a significant player over the next five or 10 years. And once you're no longer a significant player, it's very hard to catch up. AI is not yet determined, right? The, the nature of how the technology will work, what the algorithms do, exactly how they work is still being invented. 
It's a very exciting time. I wish Europe were participating in that much more. It would be much better for the United States to have an innovation partner in Europe that's just as good as the top US companies. That competition would make us stronger. We have agreement on almost everything that matters between Europe and the United States, and we should implement them. In your com um, the commission report, Eric, there's a variety of sections in terms of about values and ethics. The one thing that comes a lot up in the conversation here in Europe is about that, in enforcing sort of the Western approach, the democratic principles that underline this. What we've seen previously with Europe's, if I use, you, use your words, regulating first approach is that the US also gets left behind. We just have to look at GDPR, Europe's privacy principles, and they have become de facto global standards because like it or not, Washington hasn't shown up and uh, created its own set of federal privacy standards to, to compete with, with Europe. Are you not concerned that even though regulation may not be the right thing, if regulation does come, and it does get taken up by other Western democratic countries who also want, like the US, want to have ethical ethics and principles baked into some sort of regulation, the US may also get left behind in terms of having to participate and live by Europe's rules, mostly because Washington hasn't created its own. Our report spends an awful lot of time on, on principles. And the minister and I would almost certainly agree on 99% of all of the issues. There is, for example, in artificial intelligence, a great concern over bias. Because AI systems, machine learning systems, are trained typically from real world, world data, they have the biases that exist in the real world. They can also be manipulated in an evil way to be biased when they weren't biased to start with and so forth. There's a great deal of research on how to address that. And we say that this is a competition of values between the West and uh, autocracies by which we mean China. Do you really want um, the Chinese view of privacy and surveillance to be imbued in the tools and technologies that are used in the West, in the US and the EU? Of course you do not. Uh, that would be unacceptable to a democracy. It's not the right thing, and it's probably a bad strategy for them too. But nevertheless, that's where we are. Um, with respect to things like the GDPR, I worked pretty hard on the G G GDPR and as well as the right to be forgotten, and I understand them quite well. And I think the question is, do you celebrate a global set of rules or do you ce celebrate the companies and the industries that were created because of them? Uh, if you look at the GDPR, the large incumbents of which Google was one, tended to benefit from the GDPR because they had the resources to actually go and implement the rules uh, when they were enacted. And you'll notice that the companies didn't talk about it very much because they were ready. But it set back a large number of small companies for which uh, compliance with the rules was more expensive. Now, those companies have since gotten over that and they've grown up and so forth. That's a good example of the GDPR having a negative effect on small companies which have limited resources, although it may have been the right thing. I'm not picking on the GDPR. I'm trying to say that this salutary view that the GDPR was the, was the winner in the re global regulation does not reflect the fact that there are costs to any regulation. The minister said, you have to find the balance. My concern, and I just want to hammer on this, is that until you show both, both the investment and the opportunity, as well as the regulation, you're not going to get the best outcome. Europe should do both, not just the regulation. Minister, can I get a response to that? I, I know you, you've, we talked about investment, but it feels there's uh, a question of, are we putting the uh, car before the horse in terms of regulating when the Europe's own indigenous AI industry is relatively, uh, well, it, it's emerging to say the least. Well, um, what is the difference today between Europe and the US in terms of investment in AI? The difference, to, to be a little bit uh, uh, caricatural and, and blunt, the facts. Because who is doing the, the I, I would say, three quarter of the investment uh, in, in the US? It's a big companies, big digital companies. The problem in Europe is that we don't have any we have a lot of legacies, big companies that, that are uh, 50 to, to 20 to 50 years old, but we don't have 
neither Google nor Facebook nor uh, Amazon, uh, even no Apple. We have a few of them, Spotify, ADN, Dasso system and so on, but you can name them uh, with your two hands. And this is the main issue. This is why for uh, the past three years with President Macron, our only focus is to be able to build champions. And in almost any, um, any vertical, the, 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 the following which, which be brought about by the brought about by the fact you have champions. And this is in, in, in the, the, the main area in which uh, Europe is lagging behind. We could spend more money, but, but who would spend the money? The state? I don't think that the state is always the, the right player in order to know where to invest. So um, I, would, I would to some extent um, uh, join Eric uh, on the fact that the GDPR was a political success, but on the economic side for Europe, this, the, the, the implication has still to be, are still to be assessed. But if you look at the European uh, ecosystem and European economy, the main issue that we have is our players are too small. And, and I completely uh, join Eric on the, fact of, uh, on the fact that the main priority for Europe today should be, and this is for France, to, to know and to design a legislative, innovative, regular, uh, uh, regulation framework that is allowing, allowing those next champions to emerge. Wonderful. With about a, a minute left, I just want to do a quick, quick fire uh, response. To, we've talked a lot about the friction, we've talked a lot about the cooperation. In the very short term, in terms of c competing and working together in, to, to keep it, compete against China, what can Europe and the US do? What are some easy wins that, that could move the ball forward a little bit? Eric, can I start with you and I'll keep it quick, uh, relatively quick, please. Thank yeah, you. So, so, so real, real quick, uh, the minister and I generally agree on all these matters. Um, I want to say that the European talent pool is phenomenal. The talent that is available in France, having spent a lot of time, we set up an AI center in France at Google. Let me tell you, the French are very good at this, as are the Germans and so forth. There's every reason to think that if Europe gets its act together, which in my view it is not yet, and the minister is trying to fix that, we can see a great success, and that's critical. Um, we are hosting, our AI commission is hosting on July 13th in Washington, D.C., an international summit to try to specifically organize as much of this as we can. And we would encourage the right players to come to DC. And if you're unable to travel because of the pandemic or whatever, we'll organize things in, a, in a, an appropriate Zoom way. But I think that this is a case where we are all in wild agreement that we need to spend an awful lot of time focusing on digital threats of which the AI issue is one and digital coordination around these values. As the minister says, the issues that divide us are much smaller than the issues that unite us. We always love to focus on the issues that we disagree over, but we jointly have to succeed. Looking at the math, China has, I'm just using them as a simple example, four times as many engineers um, as the United States in STEM areas. They also have a, G a GDP and so forth of a similar scale of the United States. The only way for us to compete is to compete together. And that also, by the way, needs to include the Japanese and the South Koreans and perhaps the Indians as well. Thank you. Minister, I'll give you the final word and we're just asked to keep it relatively quick, please. Thank you. Yeah, I will be very brief. I think that there are two things that we have to be able to work on together. First one is talent. Uh, I, I, I have exactly the same approach and generic and the fact that look at the number of, of engineers that are trained in, in China. And so we have to work on that because this is an investment now that will have huge results in the coming years, first issue. And second issue, as much as we can, we have to narrow the standard and be able to, to come with, the, with similar standards in order to broaden the, the market. The bigger the market is, um, the bigger the company will be. Wonderful. Well, Eric, Cedric, thank you so much for, for joining us and thank you for everyone for tuning in. My name is Mark Scott. I'm Politico's Chief Tech Correspondent. I must give myself a, a final plug. Please sign up to, to my weekly transatlantic uh, tech newsletter called Digital Bridge. And next we'll have Melissa in a couple of minutes talking about international cooperation in the field of AI. Thanks for joining us. That's